people. Uh, you're all the time running into connections, and it's neat being, uh, being a part of the family of God. The day is going to come in each of our lives when life as we know it <clears throat> will come to an end. And truthfully, I believe that that thought should captivate our minds, not so that we live in fear, but so that we are prepared. Um, that thought not only should captivate our minds, but that thought should control our actions. Uh, you and I will reap what we sow. There will be a judgment seat of Christ. Uh, we will give an account to him. Uh, for our lives, for what we do, uh, how we spend, what we've been given. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about uh, life in general. Uh, Moses put it this way in Psalm 90, verse 12. He said, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Uh, you, are not, you are not going to live forever. Brother Ray and I were talking back there, Brother Ray Ellis, a while ago. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing pretty good. I, I, can't, I can't go real far. I said, well, you got to go real far, right? You just, if you get to the places you got to go. Uh, how old are you, Brother Ray? 80? 82? Uh, you're, you're doing pretty good, bro. Um, and, and so, but, but the reality is, before we know it, we'll all be 82. Uh, life is a vapor. It appears for a little time, vanisheth away. And Scripture is very clear about all of that. Well, in 2 Samuel 23, it's funny. I had this thought on my mind. I was coming in, I think it was Thursday, and I had been working on the message. And uh, uh, this summer, my wife doesn't come in every day, so I have a lot of time to think and um, get cut off on the highway and all that good stuff. And I was thinking about the message to think about this. And I looked and passing me was a truck pulling a little trailer <coughs> with a vault on it. Not like a money vault, like a grave vault. And I actually, I was going to give it to Luke and have him put it up for the sermon. I actually took a picture of it. Uh, that's, that's where we're all going. Uh, everything about us that can die, that's where we're all going. And, and so we, we should understand that as we look at the brevity of life, that should affect how we live and what we do. Uh, oftentimes people will say to me after a funeral, they'll say, uh, Pastor, I hope that uh, when my time comes, I, I want you to preach my funeral. I want you to preach me a good funeral like that. And I always say the same thing. You live a good life like he lived, I'll preach you a good funeral. All right, you live a rotten life. I ain't going to lie for you. Okay, I'll do my best to think of something good to say, but make it easy, would you? Uh, and, and, and that really, we, I'm, I'm cutting up a little bit, but that really should be uh, a factor in how we live and what we do is what kind of legacy we're going to live. What's, what's our testimony going to be like? Can I ask you this? What is your eulogy going to be like? What are they going to say? You know, some people that have served the Lord and been involved in our church for many years, sometimes it's a matter of figuring out what not to say because there's so much to say uh, about their life and their testimony. And then sometimes you preach funerals, it's a little harder uh, because a person did not, did not <clears throat> live for the Lord. Well, in 2 <clears throat> Samuel 23... The Bible starts out, I want you to notice verse 1. It starts out and it says, Now these be the last words of David. There's going to be a little bit of time passed between here and his passing. But it's obviously that he's nearing the shore. He's closer to the end than he is the beginning. And Samuel, in the beginning of this chapter, later on, David is going to talk about his life. He's going to talk about... Uh, I, I find it interesting in this passage that uh, much of what David talks about are people. And you know, really, when you come to the end of life, things really are not going to matter. It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is people. Uh, people who influence you and people whom you influence. That's what's going to be important to you. But at the very beginning of chapter 23, uh, Samuel talks about David. And that is going to be our text this evening. And I want to talk to you uh, just for a little bit about David's 
eulogy. Let's pray. Father, I pray you would help us as we look into your word. We'll look at a lot of scripture, but uh, our text will be this one verse as we listen to your prophet talk about this man. He was a unique man. He was, he was a man. He was a human being. His, his legacy was good and it was bad. There were, there were victories. There were defeats. Uh, he's a lot like us. And I pray tonight that we would recognize your goodness in our lives and we would determine to live a life uh, that, of worship to you, that, that our very life would testify of our belief that you're worthy. Help us in these moments. We'll not be long. We knew we'd have extra music tonight. We'll not keep people long, but use the time in our hearts and our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, I want you to notice with me tonight, David's humble beginning. His humble beginning. The first thing that we learn that is said of David is that he was the son of Jesse. Look, if you would, at chapter 23, verse 1. Now, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said. Now, that may not seem very significant to you at face value, but I think there is something that is noteworthy here. David did not come from a priestly line. David was not royalty. David was the son of a farmer. Now, we believe that Jesse was a man of some means. He was successful. And yet, uh, he, was not, he was not a who's who kind of guy. Uh, Jesse was Jesse. He was a, he was a working man. He was a, a farm owner. He was a, he was a, a shepherd. Uh, I'm sure at one time he did all the shepherding himself. We know David's story about how that David uh, came to shepherd the sheep. You remember the story how that Samuel uh, came to Jesse's house and he's, he examines all of David's older brothers. And he's looking for the king. Look, if you would, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, look with me, if you would, at verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. The Bible said, and the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. Verse 6, And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Isn't it amazing how we are such wonderful judges of people? Uh, oftentimes, how many times have you been burned? I've been burned. There have been times when I thought, Man, this person right here, and they turned out not to be the person I thought they were at all. And we've all been on that receiving end of that kind of thing. But he sees Eliab, and I don't know what all about Eliab uh, impressed uh, 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 Samuel, but he said, hey, there ain't no doubt. This is the man. Look at what God said in verse number seven. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and uh, made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Shammah came. We won't read all these verses. And Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? And Jesse has been pegged. And Jesse said in, uh, in verse number 11, he said, there remaineth yet the youngest and behold, he keepeth the sheep 
And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come thither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look, look to. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. There on the backside of Jesse's farm was a little shepherd boy, just a child, really. Goliath, when David came, remember what Goliath said? Am I a dog? that you send this, this youth out to fight with me. He wasn't impressive. He wasn't trained. He wasn't credentialed. But Almighty God knew exactly where David was. And listen to me, that same God had a plan for his life. He had a plan for David's life. And I've got news for you tonight, church. God knows where you are, and God has a plan for your life. Every single person here, God has something that he wants you to do. And you may have come, you may be a first generation Christian, and you may have, you know, we, we talked at the wedding yesterday about Melissa and her, she is uh, fourth generation in our church. And uh, Brother Pope was there and he was talking about Kevin and, and uh, the legacy that Kevin uh, has and, and was handed down to him. And you may be, be sitting here tonight and say, man, I ain't got no legacy. My, my, my dad was a, was a drunk. My mama was a prostitute. I, I, I don't have a legacy. Pastor, I just got saved this morning. Man, this is all new to me. I don't know anything. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter this, mo- this evening where you are. What matters is where you're going. You see, you, you, you understand, you understand tonight, I'm happy to tell you tonight that your beginning doesn't have to adversely affect your ending because we serve a God who is able to do so much more than we could ever hope or think. Little David, little David, what did, what did Samuel say about him? He was the son of Jesse. Just a humble beginning. But not only do we see that David had a humble beginning, but I want you to notice his miraculous exultation. His miraculous exultation. Look at verse 1. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high. You see, God went to the backside of a sheep farm, found a young shepherd, and elevated him to a position of leadership and influence that David never could have imagined even in his wildest dreams. David went from the pasture to the palace. David went from being a nobody to nobility. Can, can, can we tonight look at where we are? Hey, listen to me. Some of you, you you've got a past, and it's not a good past. And uh, some of you have come from a, a life of addiction. And some of you may be still struggling with addiction. Uh, some of you, you look back and there's things in your past that you're embarrassed about and ashamed of. We could think tonight about where maybe, where maybe you used to be and, and where you could be tonight. And think about, think about how God has worked in your life. What a good God. And, and, and here David is, and, and Samuel said, let me tell you about it. Number one, he's the son of Jesse. He, he came from a very humble beginning. But oh, let me tell you, did God do something mighty with David? He was exalted to a position of leadership. Uh, give you a few verses, Habakkuk 3.19. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Tonight, I want to remind you that if you have trusted Christ as Savior, hear me, you're a child of the King. You're somebody. You belong to God. Hey, you don't have to back up to anybody. You don't have to apologize to anybody. You don't have to be intimidated by anybody. His royal blood flows through your veins tonight and through mine. And God has miraculously exalted us. This morning we talked about John 1, 11 and 12. And, and he came into his own. But his own received him not. But as many as received him. Aren't you glad you received him? Aren't you glad you trusted him? Aren't you glad you put your faith in him? As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Revelation 1, 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about us. All right, we're talking about us. I know the world looks at us as being some kind of fringe lunatic, but listen to what God himself said about us. He hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you know Jesus, you're somebody. You're somebody. What are they going to say? What are they going to say about David? He's nearing the end of his life. Well, Samuel's going to say he had a very humble beginning. He was the son of Jesse. But oh, did God do mighty things with him. He was exalted miraculously. And then he said this. He, he talked about his divine anointing. His divine anointing. Look at verse 1. Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, and the man who was raised up on high. Notice this. The anointed of the God of Jacob. He was anointed. I, I told this, I, I don't know if I told it at graduation, but I think I told it somewhere. Josh Tankard came to our school two years ago, and uh, he was a junior in high school. And his mother called me. They're dear friends of our ministry. And his mother called me, and she said, uh, Pastor Finley, this is Dr. Tankard. And I said, well, it's nice to meet you, ma'am. I said, how can I help you? She said, well, I was inquiring about your school. She said, I have a son. And uh, she said, he is, uh, he's going to be a junior in high school. And uh, she said, I, we're looking for a good Christian school. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about, you, about your boy. And she said, well, uh, she was obviously she was obviously talking to her. It was obvious. Uh, I could tell she was African-American. And, and she could probably tell I was a white boy, probably. <laughs> And um, it was obvious that, that, that she was black, and I assumed her son was black. And I said, well, where does he go to school now? She said, well, he, he went to Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is uh, over here on Fable Street, and uh, it is a sort of a prep school. Tracy McGrady went to Mount Zion. All right? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking he's black. And he goes, don't judge me, okay? Don't judge me. I'm thinking he's black and he goes to Mount Zion. So my, my obvious question was, ma'am, does he play basketball? <laughs> and she said, oh, oh no, he's anointed. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> he's anointed. You know what? I think, and you guys can text him tonight and tell him I talked about him, but I think if you got around Josh at all this year, you know, there, he has a touch of God on his life. And, 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 and we read in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13 that, that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of all his brethren. All those, all those six foot four brethren, little teenage David, little ruddy David, they all had to watch as the anointing oil of the prophet of God ran down his head and pulled at his feet. And what that, what that, what that means is God has a purpose for you. He was consecrated. He was, he was set apart. This was the man. This was the king. This, this was God's chosen. Do you understand tonight? Jeremiah said this in chapter 29, verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you, he's talking about you, talking about me, to give you an expected end. Do you understand God has a purpose for your life? Do you understand tonight, uh, Esther, chapter 4, verse 14, uh, uh, it was said to her, And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? 
Jeremiah the prophet, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Before you were ever, before you were ever conceived, Jeremiah, before you ever conceived, I had a plan for your life. I created you for a distinct and divine purpose. And let me just tell you tonight that you will not have peace in your heart and you will not have true joy until you fulfill the purpose for which you were created. You can try everything you can think of, but if you're not doing tonight what God made you to do, your life is an empty life. But, but think about this. Think about this. God has a purpose for you. So what did they say about David? They said, well, he, he was the son of Jesse. He's the son of Jesse. He, he come from, he was just a farm boy. But oh man, did God do some things in his life. He was miraculously exalted. But not only was he miraculously exalted, but he had a divine anointing. God had a purpose for his life. And then one last thing tonight. Notice with me, if you would, at the end of verse 1, back in our text. If I can get there. The end of verse 1. He was the anointed of the God of Jacob. And the sweet psalmist of Israel. The sweet psalmist of Israel. I wrote this down in my notes. He talked about his sweet devotion. David, David didn't just serve God. David loved God. David didn't just do what he do out of, do what he did out of duty. An obligation. But he, as a matter of fact, I, I think it's in my notes here. The Bible said he was a, he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. That, that he had a connection. Yeah. That, that he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. A psalmist was someone who was a poet and a songwriter. And the Holy Spirit used David to pen about half of the Psalms that we read, we say to people, I've said this to many of you, and some of you have said this to others. We say to people, when you're hurting, go to the Psalms, right? Yeah. And when you're hurting, go to the Psalms. Read, read the Psalms. Why? Because, because they remind you of what a good God you serve. Amen. Let, me, let me give you one. Let me give you one. The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That was David that wrote this. I understand. Inspired by the Spirit of God, obviously, we understand that. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That was the sweet psalmist of Israel that wrote that. You know what? He had a relationship with God that brought him peace and comfort in the midst of the worst of times because he had a sweet devotion toward God. I think about, I think about David. I think about, I, I think about him being a man who didn't just go through the motions, who did not just, he wasn't duty bound to live for God. He, he didn't live in fear he, he didn't do what he did for God because he was afraid not to. He didn't serve out of obligation, but he was a man whose heart was knit to God's heart. And he really loved God. Can I ask you tonight, do you really love God? Do you really love the Lord? Paul was rehearsing the history of God's people in the synagogue. You know what he did? He talked about Egypt. He talked about the wilderness. He talked about Canaan, he talked about the judges, and he talked about Saul. In Acts 13, verse 22, the Bible said, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Paul's talking here. He talks about David, to whom he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. You say, well, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. I don't know if I 
I don't know if I have a heart like that. Well, let me, let me look at the rest of the verse. A man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? You say, well, I, I, I don't know if I have a, I don't know if I have a heart after the heart of God. Well, is his will the most important thing in your life? Do you understand tonight how good God's been to you? I think about I think about David out in the wilderness watching sheep, and he's thinking about the goodness of God in his life. And he he begins to write in Psalm eight, verse three: "When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him?" That's the sweet psalmist of Israel. He's out there and he's looking. You know, we don't even take time to do that. We're too busy. Sometimes too busy serving him. To really just stop and look around and realize the one who spoke all this into existence, he's our father. And David looked up and he said, when I consider thy heavens, the moon and the stars... Who am I, God? Why do you care about me? Why do you want a relationship with me? Why in the world, God, would you give your son for me? One day a lion attacks his flock and another day a bear. And in Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2, David said, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. You know what, David? David David knew, David knew that, man, every time I've ever been in trouble and I've ever called out to God, God has always delivered me. Could we not say that tonight? One day he's anointed by Saul. Psalm 63, 6 and 7, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. One day he realizes Saul is trying to destroy him. And Psalm 18, 1 says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. You just, you just follow his life. One day he's confronted with his sin. With Bathsheba. And in Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Yeah, there were times. There were times when David's humanity got the best of him. But even in those times, David knew God loved him. Would you stop? Matt, you guys come here. Would you stop for a minute tonight and just think? Would you stop tonight and think about where you could be? Where you could be. I look at one. I, I remember when you told me about your salvation. One and Denise hadn't been coming to church here very long. And it was about a year ago. And the whole world went upside down. And the whole George Floyd thing. And I came to one when I said, hey man, I, I want to take you guys out after church night. And we went to Chili's. And I said, I need you to teach me something. I need you to help me. And he laughed. I said, no, you can help me. I said, you can help me. And I said, uh, I, I gave him my testimony. I told him that when I, when I became a pastor here, when I became a pastor here, you just play softly, Sharon, would you? When I became a pastor here, our church had never had 
had never had a church member that wasn't Caucasian. Never had. When I was a young boy, when I was a young boy, I showed up. I'm not, I'm not trying to indict people, but I'm just telling you. When I came to, for visitation one Saturday, the first 15 minutes, I was probably 12 years old. They taught me what to do in case I knocked on the door of a black man. Because whatever you do, don't invite him to church. That was here. And I said, Juan, I, I said, I, I think, I don't, I don't think I'm racist. Man, you listen to that news, that'll mess your head up. And he said, Pastor, he said, I'm just going to tell you what he said. Can I tell him what you said? He's African-American. Here's what he said. And God bless you, black people. You know I love you. But here's what he said. He said, preacher, from the day I was old enough to understand, they taught me you hate me. You're out to get me. He said, and then some of these guys who've got a platform, Al Sharpton and some of these guys, they pick it up. He said, the reason I understand is not because I'm educated. It's because I'm saved. He said, I was, I was at the bus stop going to boot camp. And my grandma told me right before I left the house, she said, Juan, you better get right with God. You go over there somewhere and die in battle, you're going to go to hell, Juan. He said, I went to get on the bus, and he said, I couldn't get off my mind. He said, I got down at the bus stop, and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, you know what? All that junk, all that junk I've been fed, all that stuff I've been fed all my life, he said, I, I saw right through that. God's been good, hasn't he? He's been really good. Think about where you could be tonight. Hey, think about where you ought to be tonight. Think about where you came from. Think about where you came from. First time I ever walked into this church, I was three years old. Three years old. I think about what God's done. Humble, humble beginnings. But oh man, has he not highly exalted us? You know what? We're blessed and highly favored, my friend. We're people of God. Kings and priests. Do you love him? Do you love him? I asked them to sing. I want them to sing and then we're going to... I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's stand. They're going to sing. This is going to be our invitation. Tonight, I want you to think. You guys go ahead and sing. I want you to think about how good God's been to you. And maybe, maybe you ought to come tonight and just thank him.